Okay, yeah. perfect. So now let's look at, again, this story, uh, this prologue, this God, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was turned toward God, and what God was, the Word also was. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made. What took place in Him was life, and, his, and the life was the light of humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony, to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to those who received him, who believed into his name, he gave power, exousion, to become technetheu, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the fullness of a gift that is truth. We have gazed upon his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his fullness have we all received a gift in place of a gift. For the law was given through Moses. The gift that is the truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is turned toward the Father, He has made Him known. John chapter 1, verses 15 to 16. That's where we are today. That's what we're looking at. The revealer. The only Son turned toward the Father who discloses God to the Johannine Jesus group. So we got to look at this. We got to see what's going on. So let's go one more time to this text, this little last bit of the prologue, because that's what we're going to be swimming in in this the rest of this hour and the next hour. John chapter 1, verse 15 to 18. John, the dunker, bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his fullness have we all received a gift in place of a gift. For the law was given through Moses. The gift that is the truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is turned toward the Father, He has made Him known. History again enters the hymn as the dunker cries out his first words of witness. The first description of the word gets recalled. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, in Arche and Hologos, in the beginning was the word, and the word was turned toward God. And what God was, the Word also was. He was in the beginning with God. The dunker proclaims that one who is coming, Erchomenos, present participle, follows John in terms of the temporal sequence of events. So you might think, he's inferior to John. But don't think that. Because in reality, he was in the beginning with God. John wasn't. So even though he follows John in the temporal sequence of events, 
John the Dunker, everybody knows that, right? John the Dunker came first. This is a historical fact. John the Dunker came first, then Jesus came after, right? His ministry began really after, probably historically, after John had already been executed. That's when the Jesus movement, probably stage one, began. But don't think that means that John is superior to Jesus. Mm -mm. So the author of the fourth gospel called John is stressing something for us. Even though Jesus follows John in a temporal sequence of events, John came first, then came Jesus, Jesus is before John. He is in the beginning with God. In terms of his place in God's design, the word gegonen, perfect tense of the Greek genomai, existed before John the Dunker. He existed in the beginning. In a return to the imperfect tense of the verb to be, ain, of verse 1, the Dunker explains how this was so. Hoti protos mu ain. Because before me he was, like Yoda. Because before me he was. <laughs> if you really translated it literally. Because he was before me. Because he was before me. Hoti protos mu ain. John chapter 1 verse 15. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me. For he was before me. He's superior to me. Remember, in this ancient world, older the better. This is the second of five occasions in the fourth gospel in which the author explicitly places John the Dunker below Jesus in an honor ranking. And remember, in first century Israel, even in this anti-society, honor and shame are everything. As indicated last week when we talked about this, you all remember? There's an implied, this, this implies a defensiveness on the part of the author. Every time this topic is, is brought up, every time John the Dunker comes up, he doesn't want to slam John, he doesn't want to knock John, but the author feels it's very necessary every time the subject matter of John, and he has to bring up John the Dunker, it's, it's, he's an important figure. He was sent from God. But every time he has to bring up John the Dunker, he's got to, he's defensive. He has to show Jesus superiority to John the Dunker. And that implied defensiveness on this topic, a touchy subject, isn't it, for him, may be an indication of a rivalry that existed between the disciples of John the Dunker and the disciples of Jesus. Moving right along. So John chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. And from his fullness have we all received a gift in place of a gift. For the gift of the law, the, the, the law was given, a gift, right? Through Moses. The gift that is the truth came through Jesus Christ. Didn't Moses see God? No one has ever seen God. Didn't Jacob, Israel, see God? He wrestled. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is turned toward the Father, He has made Him known. How do I get this knowledge, by the way? I better get with this Jesus group. The Greek word charis, Latin gratia, may be translated grace or favor, unsolicited gift. The language of grace or favor is the language of Mediterranean patron-client relationships, patronage, brokerage. Patron 
Christians are higher status Mediterranean persons who provide favors for clients in return for respect, honor, and generalized obedience. Patrons owed nothing whatsoever to their clients. When they gave something to a client, they bestowed favors, and they were understood to be gracious. So, in order to understand the contrast, charin anti caritas, a great, sometimes translated grace, right? You know, a, a, a gift in place of a gift here. In order to understand the contrast of the gift that comes through Moses and the gift that comes through Jesus is really has to be understood in the context of Mediterranean patronage. The contrast between what was required, the law, and what was gracious, the incarnation of God's own word. Do we understand this? Yes. So does that kind of hint that this gift was given even though we didn't do anything to merit it? I mean, where before... It can't be earned. It's completely free. Right. It was all on the initiative of the patron. Because the patron, what a patron does is he takes people that are not really related to him and he makes them his fictive kin. Fictive, but not fictional. It's not a lie. He makes them his, he kinifies them by making them his patron. That's why you call him Godfather. Don Corleone, I'm honored and pleasured to be here on the day your daughter is to be married. And I hope your first child will be a masculine child. <laughs> so when God is referred to as Father in the Bible, it's more like Godfather. It's Patron. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you people in here that are of perhaps Latin background? A patron. Yeah. As far as the difference between what Moses received and what Jesus received. The patron can demand things from his clients, from his kin, his, 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 his kinified clients. They, remember that the son, whether it's whether whether the son is uh, biological or fictive, is still a real son. It's not fictional, and a son owes filial obligation to the patron. That owed filial obligation is the instruction of Torah. You have to represent the household honorably. Don't shame, dishonor the God of Israel. And yet, the father is bountiful, the patron is bountiful with his clients. And so he gave this incredible gift that surpasses the first one, but doesn't make the first one bad. It's not, it, there's not like an evil gift and a good gift. It's something like that. Or a really crappy gift and an awesome, excellent gift. No, two excellent gifts. Two honorable gifts. Two birthday presents. Ex right. One incredible calling to be, to belong to God in a special way that was given to the dominant society Israel, the world in John. But to those who responded fully, who listened fully, who received the word when the others rejected, there's this other gift that was given to the whole world, Israel, the dominant society. Many in the dominant society rejected it, though. That's the great sadness. But not the Johannine Jesus group. So, then there's this other gift that's gracious. And that gift makes us technatheu. The name, probably the name of the Johannine Jesus group. Children of God. And you want to know something? What is the first 18 verses and really the whole gospel all about? You could say, well, it's about the Word becoming flesh. 
Yeah, but really it's all about becoming technetheu, becoming children of God. That's what it's about. You want to know what the height of the first 18 verses is? But to those who received him. Who believed into his name, he gave exousion, authority power, to become children of God. That's the height. Who are not produced by sexual desire, uh, I mean, uh, you know, mixing of blood, biochem, bio, bio, biochemistry, you know, biology, first century Mediterranean, Middle Eastern biology, not produced by uh, sexual desire, not produced because a man decides, I want to have an heir, so let me have an heir. It's not produced by human design or effort. It's completely a gracious gift from God. Yes? Well, I'm just going to say, you know, when kids get to be teenagers and they're like, well, I didn't ask to be born. Oh, they do say that. <laughs> uh, what a shameful... See, and for, middle, for 80% of the world, that is extremely shameful. That is extre But, you know, what do you expect? It's extremely shameful. What a, is this how you receive a gift? So the Joe and I Jesus group say, well, that's typical of, 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 of those in darkness. The light, but the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The greatest gift that we really didn't reserve, deserve, but we received. Yes. Joe. Yeah. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right? Is there any order we put them in, or they're all the same? I mean, they're all, one doesn't have more power than the other. Right? Now that's Trinitarian. And I'm going to touch that on that a little bit in the second hour. Okay. So can we put a pin on it? Because I can't. I don't want to do it now. That's not really my question. Okay. All right. In other words, you can't say, "Gee, God the Father is." We believe they're co-equal. Okay. Co-eternal, right? Good. Now, Jesus was here. We know all about Jesus. Yeah. Do we? Yeah. Well, well, There's precious little. We we try to understand. No, no, no. We got to be humble with that. We, we have parameters that we try to understand and we can better understand more and we're trying to do that in this study. Okay, my question is, they all have the same power, you might say. What do you mean we never saw God? We saw Jesus. He's God. Mm -hmm. Okay, God. like I said, Joe, let me, let me wait to the second hour on that. These are metaphysical questions. We're going to get to those questions. What does it mean we never see? Right. So, theologically speaking, I'll bite a little bit. Christologically speaking, uh, both, G, both John and the author of 2 Timothy agree that no one has ever seen God or can see God because God dwells in an approachable, unapproachable light. God's glory is so awesome that it dwarfs even the sun's glory, the stars, all of those archangels. Nothing can get... But somehow, according to the fourth gospel, the sun had, as word, had direct access. Not the Holy Spirit? No. Hold on. Let's, let's, let's not think of this in either or. Later on, we developed this understanding that the Holy Spirit is the love and the life that's shared between the Father and the Son. That's what we profess on Sundays, right? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. Joe's question gets into a very important element in our Catholic Christian faith called sacramentality. There is no in going to God that is not indirect, Joe. Because God is, by definition, the sheer act of existence itself. Beyond even what our biblical ancestors in the faith, who were not speculative thinkers, understood. God, holy and absolute mystery, that they did speak about, is, is through much development and understanding, we come to understand, is not a thing among things. So he cannot be experienced directly. He's infinite. We can only experience the infinite through the finite, sacramentally, indirectly. So when they looked at Jesus, they were looking at God. Amen. Yes, we believe that as Catholic Christians because he, we believe he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Sure. Got it. And you can't wait, wait, Joe. Well, hold on. Wait one second. Wait one second. But what they are seeing is not directly his divinity. They are seeing his humanity, which is the sacramental sign and instrument of his divinity. 
Whenever you look on Jesus, you can say, yeah, I'm looking at God. You can also say, I'm looking at God by looking at all things. Jesus is our unsurpassable way. The most intense way. The humanity of Jesus is the unsurpassable, most intense way of experiencing God. And yet, even in that, when I look at Jesus' humanity, I'm still experiencing God indirectly, sacramentally. That's just the way it is, folks. Otherwise, it's not God we're talking about. Otherwise, what we're talking about is a God, not God. And that's why what we kind of need is a holy atheism. A holy atheism. You must forever be in the refinement business of your God concepts. And that, that's the mystical tradition of the church. That's St. Thomas Aquinas. So, that's why our formula, even our dogmatic formula, are forever in need of refinement. Purifications, because all human language is limited. That doesn't mean it's useless. That doesn't mean it's worthless. So try to understand, Jesus is not a stand-in word for God. Jesus refers to the incarnation of the Word of God, God's own self-communication, which we believe, as Catholic Christians, is eternal. Okay? But now we're talking, we're, we're getting out, of, we're, we're going, we're, we're, we're inspired by the Johannine text, but we're actually getting away by a few centuries. We've jumped ahead a few centuries of development. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's be honest to the text, right? Yes? Yes? Let's go back. To see, so we can have a better way of understanding how this pool, this gorgeous deep pool that we have in Catholic tradition, got filled. All right. So here's the contrast the contrast between the gift of Moses and the gift, the gift through Moses and the gift through Jesus Christ is the contrast between what was required and what was gracious. The poem of John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18 moves from the celestial realm of the sky vault, the realm of God, the God of Israel, to the people of Israel, among whom the word is enfleshed, and then back up to the celestial realm of the sky vault. In first century Mediterranean terms, the realm of God in the sky vault is located directly over Jerusalem the center of Israel, Jerusalem, the navel of the earth, the center. So please understand that when you read the Gospel of John in its literal sense, these people were not universalists. There's nothing universal going on here. This is ethnocentrically particular to Israel. Do you understand what I'm saying here? See the hole there? See the hole in the sky vault there? On the icon. Thus the poem ends where it began. The word was turned toward God. The proston theon. The close interpersonal relationship between father and son is what makes it possible for the son to reveal the Father. In fact, where we have Son, we could put Broker. And where we put Father, we can put Patron, Patron. As the Gospel proceeds, it will also be the bond that creates and enables in-group glue, bonding, among group members to Jesus and among group members to each other. The relationship between the Father and the Son is the in-group glue that enables bonding among group members to Jesus in the Johannine Anti-Society and among each other. Can you see how this will later on be developed to understanding? To understanding that the proston theon, the intense interpersonal relationship between the Word and God, between the Father and the Son, is what will come to be known as the Holy Spirit as a 
person, as the third person of the Most Holy Trinity? Do we have that glue here? I got to tell you, I believe He is present. The Holy Spirit is present. But I have to ask, are we really bonded together in in-group glue here at our parish? Maybe we are. Maybe we need a lot of more openness to the Spirit. To be emotionally anchored together. To cry when the other go hurts. To identify with the Beloved and say, Ouch. Love creates the Beloved. Because God is love, right? That interpersonal in-group glue. So love if God creates, love creates. If you haven't created anybody today, maybe you haven't loved anybody today. Got to take a little hard look. Enough has been said of the word coming into the world, the dominant society, Israel. John chapter 1, verses 3c to 4. What took place in him was life, and the life was the light of humankind. John chapter 1, verse 9. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world, the dominant society, Israel. John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the fullness of a gift that is truth. We have gazed upon His glory, glory as of the only Son, broker, from the Father, Patron. John chapter 1, verse 16, And from His fullness have we all received a gift gracious in place of a gift expected uh, behavior pattern required the author of John moves to a final treatment of humankind's reception and response to the gift that is the word the author explains that from his fullness ectu pleromatos autu I love that word pleroma the fullness we have all received in verse 16 traditionally the Greek word charis has been read as grace and the critics the biblical historical critics have wondered about the meaning of the preposition that joins the two uses of the word in this expression we find here in the first 18 verses, charen anti caritos. It is difficult to understand charen anti anti caritos, anti anti caritos, a place like a, a gift, grace against another grace. That's very difficult to understand. If you are a Christian, and you take the expression charis to mean grace in a theological sense. I mean, can you have a, gay, a grace from God be set against another grace from God? Is Jesus against Moses? Is the in-group glue uh, that makes us technotheu, children of God, against the law? The Torah? Well, perhaps what the text is telling us is that there are two gifts. There's no bad gifts. There are two wonderful gifts. And one gift perfects the other gift. You were given the gift to be responsible children. But I'm going to, even if you're not responsible, I'm going to make you children. Because that's my real desire is to make you children. Children of God. How beautiful is that? By the way, does that mean you're not going to be disciplined? Remember, these are Middle Eastern, Mediterranean people. How do, how do boys get treated? Go ask the author of Hebrews about that. Okay, how fathers love their sons. How they attach themselves to their sons. Yeah. When I think about the gifts, I think about how you explained at one time that everything in the ancient world was given, including honor. So for the Joe and I and Jesus group to make all of these very strong claims about giving Jesus the honor, that means the honor is being shifted or taken from some other 
place. It's being restored, actually. Restored. It's being restored. They don't... No Jesus group believes that the honor that they're going to receive, the high lofty status of being associated with the Messiah Jesus, is going to be a gift that is uh, out of place. It, it, it's, it's a restoration of honor that's been properly taken from them. And so in the end of time, whenever that is, nobody's going to get any extra honor. The things that were distributed rightly in the beginning are going to be brought back no more, no less. Blessed is, right, honorable is he who hungers and thirsts for justice, for righteousness. Does that sound like who, who, he will be filled? Yeah, he will get his righteousness, his proper honor status. No more, no less. That's another great thing to learn about happiness, by the way, that we can learn from our ancient Middle Eastern ancestors in the faith. A wonderful prayer, right? What should I pray? If I had a genie, what should I pray for if I only had one wish? Everlasting life? How would that be fun if everybody dies around me? Uh, great health? Awesome. Same thing, right? A lot of money, but if I can't live and enjoy that money, what good is it? If I can't properly spend it, and, and if I see the suffering of those around me, I mean, it can only be used as a shield to keep me in this little husk of my own isolation. Miserable. Now, here's a beautiful thing. What if I told you that there is a real wish we can ask, and it, a prayer, not to a genie, but to a God who loves us, and He'll always grant this prayer. Lord, grant that I will be content no matter what comes. That's an answerable prayer. Okay. Almost. Almost. We're almost done. John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. The gift that is the truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 17 immediately explains these two gifts and their relationship. Don't stop it. No. Let's keep it going. There have been two unique gifts of God in the human story. The first gift the law in the first place god gave the law through moses dia edote however there is now another gift already mentioned by verse 14 and by verse 16 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us the fullness of a gift that is truth we have gazed upon his glory glory as of the only son from the father and from his fullness have we all received a gift in place of a gift. This is the gift that is the truth. Hey, charis, kai he aletheia. 